girls to go and welcome back to my channel. It honestly has been a while, so without much talk, I just really want to tell you about the books that I've read recently. Recently is really a stretch here. The first book that I want to talk about is You Should Be So Lucky by Kate Sebastian. I'm looking at my laptop. It is an M.M. Romance set in 1960 s New York, and it's incredibly charming. If you have not read this yet, I highly recommend it. It felt like Booth, a punch in the gut, and at the same time, a um, warm cup of coffee on a rainy day. This was incredible. As you know, I've launched a book club on Fable recently in June. And we've been having a lot of fun reading this book. I think this one was our first. If you're interested in the book club, you can join freely. It's not a private book club. You don't have to be a member of anything. You don't have to be a member of my Patreon. I don't even have a Patreon. It is free for all. And I'd actually be really happy to see more people there. We're reading a new queer book every month and the genre is constantly changing. So if you're not into a certain genre, you can wait it out and pick up a book that you're interested in next month. I'm going to leave the link to the club down below. In other news, I'm also migrating from Goodreads to Fable and I'm gonna uh, be updating Fable more often because I just find the platform more fun than Goodreads. So if you want to be my friend there, add me. You Should Be So Lucky is a historical romance set in the 60s, so it comes with a few expected conflicts. The story is about Eddie, a very talented baseball player that is getting transferred from a smaller team in Ohio to New York and who starts experiencing a very public and very humiliating and lucky streak. A lot of eyes are on him, people were rooting for him to do well in the New York team. Ada is grappling with being lonely, with being far away from home and experiencing humiliation constantly because of his inability to play well at the moment. He's constantly on the news and he cannot deal with this much attention. The second character, Mark, is a um, grumpy, slightly older, still young man, is a reporter that is assigned to report on Eddie to create sort of um, profile type articles for his paper. Mark is extremely disinterested in sports. He's very much openly gay, as much as you can be openly gay in the 1960s. He also is grieving the death of his partner, who passed very quickly and very unexpectedly from heart attack. They're very opposite in terms of personality. In general, they are in different stages of life. And uh, Eddie has a lot of maturing to do, but it was incredibly interesting to see their journey. I'm a big fan of Kat Sebastian. I think she's incredibly talented, so I'm biased, but I think it's one of her best works. There was so much romantic tension and uh, tender, sensual vulnerability that is incredibly important in all memorable romances that sometimes I would read a passage in the book and my heart would squeeze because of how real these characters felt and how much I related to their struggles, specifically with the public private conflict. Eddie is a public person. He is a, a baseball player, a very famous baseball player. And Mark has a hang up about dating someone who can't be at least a little bit out uh, because of his previous relationship. They both have a lot of insecurities and they had to work so much to make this relationship happen. And it was so endearing and uh, I got extremely attached to them as characters. I really, really loved this book and it is undeniably one of my favorites by Kat Sebastian now. I think she's done an incredible job with this one. It is equal parts angsty and heartwarming 
and uh, tender and beautiful and just hopeful. I loved it. The next much, much lighter read, but one that I have not heard about from anyone on booktube is Pressure Hat by J. Romero. It is also an romance, but it's part cozy mystery, which is a newer genre blend for me, but I really liked it, so I think I'm going to delve deeper into it. Essentially, it's a mystery with a side of romance, which is not new. I watch a lot of shows that have similar setups, and I really, really enjoy them because I like mysteries and thrillers, but I want a little something spicy on the side, usually, or at least something angsty or something with unresolved sexual romantic tension, because to me, those things are just perfect together. It's the perfect combo. So I was very happy when I found this. This is not a very dark and grim mystery. It's not a thriller. It is a little lighter, cozier, but there's definitely tension. This story has a an element of fantasy, I guess, because the protagonist named Tom has an unusual talent that he uses to investigate things with. If an object has a lot of shame or big negative emotions tied to it, then he would be able to easily locate it. So his talents are actually very useful for police work, but he chooses to not go into this career. He is uh, quite fine being a plumber, but he has a detective in the police, a friend, I guess, that he helps with investigations sometimes. And then the start of this novel, during an investigation, he finds a body that was left in the woods and uh, the mother of the woman who was found dead also hires a private investigator named Phil. Tom and Phil have a history together. They go back. Phil was Tom's bully in school and Tom was injured accidentally when Phil and his friends were chasing him. So they are not on best terms. They have to work together on this case and confront their past. There's a lot of really juicy stuff in this novel that I love. It's very much 2000 AU fan fiction with your favorite characters. I fell head over heels with these characters. I found this novel so witty and funny and the chemistry between Tom and Phil is incredible. There's also a lot of unresolved sexual tension between them. They keep secrets. Uh, they are trying to work together, but they are distracted a lot because horny. They also are trying to grapple with their past and with the shame of how they treated each other in the past, specifically how Phil treated Tom, how much it was tied to his own uh, personal struggles with his sexuality. It is really good. If you're looking for something lighter, but something that has a lot of romantic and sexual tension at the same time, and you love the co-worker forced proximity type of romance, Says, I'm going to recommend this. The mystery is also pretty fun, as in I was not bored and falling asleep while I was reading it. And I will definitely check out the rest of the series because their journey continues. And I think it has at least four books. I'm really, really interested what's going to happen next. And I love 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 this kinds of media so hopefully i won't get bored with it in book form going further i think i gave this book four stars but honestly it was such a hit for me i'm thinking maybe it deserves four and a half as in uh, sometimes a book just comes at the right time and if you're struggling or if you're looking for a book that is going to feel like a warm hug that is just going to hit, you know what to do. The next book that I want to 
talk about is actually also a woman's, but I would not really classify it as just pure romance. This is gonna be Divine Evil by Nora Roberts. It is officially classified as romantic suspense. I already said in one of my videos, in my Meteor Chicken videos, chicken? Chicken. <laughs> chicken videos, that it really reminded me of Stephen King and I think this was just the writing style that was popular at the time. It's an older book. It is very detailed. It's very long. I think it's more than 500 pages and 500 page romantic suspense is very unusual. Women's in general is usually not that long, specifically the traditionally published romans. So I was very surprised by that. It has a very gripping plot. It is also extremely outdated in certain moments. But when I pick up a book that is older, I expect it. I won't complain about it because it's just something that I made myself do. I just have to live with it. So Divine Evil is a very interesting and not little book, as we established, about a woman named Claire who is an artist in New York. Uh, she is quite big and uh, she's just past divorce and is struggling uh, with her past. A lot of the things in her life were affected by a very sudden passing of her father and she's blaming herself in a way for missing the signs her father killed himself after the tragedy their picture perfect uh, family fell apart and she's been struggling with uh, nightmares and uh, some memories that she can't really pinpoint she's constantly dreaming about her hometown and a group of people in uh, hoods uh, murdering a woman and she doesn't know where this nightmare comes from and uh, the work that she's doing with her therapist doesn't really help. So she decides to move back to her little town and see if confronting the issue head on is going to help. The move has to help, so she does move in her old home and she also meets a man named Cameron with whom she had a little bit of a history. He was a little older than her and she had a bit of a crush on him when she was a teen. So now they are rekindling or I guess just starting out their romance. Um, but the life in this town is not an ideal picture. She uh, is reminded of how close-minded and how gossipy the community was when she was growing up. And the town also suddenly is flooded with uh, bodies, brutally murdered uh, bodies of young women. So uh, Cameron, who actually is a detective, has to investigate it. And Claire has to figure out if her memories and nightmares are connected to uh, the murders or not. It is very much a small town, grimy underbelly type of novel. It's culty, it's violent, it is not mincing words. Actually, I was quite surprised uh, at times at certain scenes, but I wouldn't say that they were bad. I was refreshed with how descriptive and uh, non-timid uh, the Nora Roberts writing style was. I think some of it will be too much for some people, but not for me. This was interesting. It was interesting specifically because the novel is older. I would say that some of the things are outdated. It's very much a diet culture type of book. Uh, I will give you some examples. Claire is a very thin woman. It is empathized many times how fit she is without actually trying. She eats a lot but she never gains anything and a lot of other women are worried about calories and about the things they eat constantly. This is like a constant thing in this novel. Uh, a lot of women are on a diet, a lot of women are commenting on other women's bodies, a lot of men are commenting on women's bodies. It is a little 
jarring to read, I guess, in 2024, but I was just ignoring it, to be quite honest with you. There was a lot of not like other girl moments when it came to Claire, but I was letting it slide because I was interested in the overall plot of the story. There's a lot of slut shaming, a lot of inappropriate comments from the point of views of men in the story. Some of this men are bad men, so it makes sense. But there were also a few sleazy comments from Cameron, who's the love interest, and I didn't appreciate them. But overall, I would say it's bearable and the storyline is interesting enough to grip you. The romance between Claire and Cameron is take it or leave it for me. I'm not a big fan of police type uh, protagonists or love interests in general because they often overstep boundaries and it's considered hot in this novel which I guess for some people it's a kink or just you know a preference they like to read uh, about dominant male characters not my thing because I'm not into men in general so I was just not feeling the romance much, but the mystery storyline, the thriller storyline definitely gripped me. I'm very interested in cults, so I guess that the, is the part that kept me going. Overall, very interesting read, and I'm definitely curious about other romantic suspense by Nora Roberts. I think I will be able to find some gems there. The next novel is going to rip your heart out, and I warned you, so <laughs> proceed with caution. I didn't know why I read this, because I kind of want to unread it. It's Here We Go Again by Alison Cochran. Not that it is a bad novel, it's a really good, incredible novel with great pacing and some very important messaging and uh, some incredibly interesting relationship dynamics. But was it incredibly devastating too? Yes, it was. And I cried and could not stop uh, when I was reading the end of the story. It was just terrifying and vulnerable, devastating and uh, sort of hopeless. I don't really like to think about death in general and this is very death focused and grief focused. So it was difficult for me to handle, but was it written in a beautiful way? Was it a great work of fiction in general? Yes, yes it was. So the story of Here We Go Again is about Logan and Rosemary. They are best friends turned, I don't want to say enemies, but they're not on good terms. It is all because of a kiss they shared as teenagers that went awry. They're very opposite and they don't see eye to eye often, but they work at the same school. And they're also in a very close and warm relationship with their ex-English teacher. Uh, who's struggling with cancer. The last prognosis doesn't give him a lot of time, so he asks Rosemary and Logan to accompany him for a road trip. Oh god, I can't even say it. Um, for his last road trip. They love him so much, they decide to organize it and go with him on this road trip. I love the romance. I mean, I guess in a way it felt a little superficial for me that they fell out because of such a petty reason. They kissed as teens and one of them went on to kiss someone else immediately because she was just trying to figure out her sexuality. So the other one was pissed at her and felt rejected and that's why they never talked after, not as friends at least. And I think being so petty that you don't talk to each other for 10 years because of the kids is a bit much, but they do spend a lot of time together on the road and they hash it out and the romantic relationship that they built together and the reasoning behind their insecurities made a lot of sense for me. 
I actually really, really loved how Alison Cochran approached the sexual part of the relationship. Uh, one of the characters is demisexual, I guess we can count her as demisexual. And the way Alison Cochran tied the emotional part of the relationship to the sexual part of the relationship was very appealing to me personally. I loved that they found each other on this journey, but the fact that this man, this poor man, was slowly dying throughout this road trip and how with every chapter his situation was becoming more and more humiliating because he couldn't take care of himself and had to ask for help from this young woman. I just couldn't handle it. It's one of my greatest fears. It was very difficult to read. The story also has a lot to do with the one that got away trope, with not acting when you could to be happy, with losing your one and only because of fear. And um, that also struck a deep chord inside of me because this is something that I'm also very scared of. The English teacher, closer to the middle of this novel, he's reconnecting with someone from his past that he left because he just couldn't handle it. And um, there's so much regret and so much heartbreak and heartache in those scenes. While the characters are trying to uh, keep their head up and be positive, the bittersweetness of the situation was so palpable the whole time. As I've said, I would like to unread this book because it hurt me deeply. And <laughs> I gave it four stars because it's a little long, but Overall, if you're looking for something to cry to, I think this one is perfect. But I resent Alison Cochran for writing this book because I was looking for a romantic comedy as per usual from her and this was not it. Because this book so deeply devastated me, I had to read something else, something lighter, and Fable actually recommended me The Delegate Dream Department Store by Lee Mi Yi. And it is a translated Korean cozy fantasy that is so delightful. The world building in this book was so interesting. It's a little bit capitalist and not joyful if you really think about it, but overall the vibes were there. I love the atmosphere and yes, the world building was so fun. So this story is about a department store that sells dreams. And the not joyful capitalist part comes from the fact that it literally monetized dreaming, the thing that we do for free. One of the really only things somewhat that we can experience for free that are joyful and that are restful and that are fulfilling. In this book, to experience interesting dreams, to experience joyful dreams, you have to pay for them. Thankfully, you don't have to pay with money, you have to pay with emotions, but you still have to pay. Uh, this is a story of Penny, the new employee of the Delegate Dream Department store and uh, her just navigating her new job. She's been a fan of this business for ages. Uh, she has her favorite dream makers that she admires and she is stepping into a role of a salesperson in this department. and. She tells little stories, it's a bunch of different stories of her experiences in the dream department store, of the dream makers that she meets that are not what she expected, of the way the work in the dream department store is organized, of the people that work there, of the relationship that she develops with them. It was very, very joyful. It was very interesting and I loved the concept of it. It reminded me a little bit of a Miyazaki movie. It had this 
curious, dreamlike nature. I think Penny is a really fun character to read from because it's a fish out of water type of situation. And I also uh, really like her quirky co-workers. It was just one of those books that took me back to uh, starting my first job at the office, but in a fun way. So if you're looking for something that is not challenging, something fun, cozy, uh, something fantastical and dreamlike, I would recommend this book. I actually really enjoyed it and I don't have a really good track record with cozy fantasy so far because the usually lock conflict and I love conflict. This one doesn't really have conflict, but I think what fascinated me the most about this story is the world building. It was interesting. I have not seen people talking about it, but I think it's popular because Fable said that it's a Korean bestseller and that was translated because it was so popular. The next book I loved, and I talked a little bit about it in my interview with the Vampire recommendation video. Basically, I gave you some book recommendations if you love the interview The Vampire, the new TV show on AMC. This one is definitely Interview with the Vampire adjacent. It's very much Hannibal-esque. We know that I love the show. I know a Hannibal girly when I see one or when I read her work because this is inspired, I gotta say. It's inspired. It is Bloom by Delilah C. Dawson. Also a book that I have not seen a lot on booktube, but I loved it. And if you know my taste, you know why. So this is a story of an obsession an infatuation. It's about Rosemary, uh, who is trying to find magic in her life. Uh, she feels like her life is very pedestrian and that uh, she has not reached her potential, her full potential. She just broke up with her boyfriend who was cheating on her and she doesn't trust anyone. She has a conflict, an active conflict with her parents. And she's trying to find glamour in her life. She's trying to change things around, to feel a little bit more, to be the main character in her story. So she goes to unusual places for her specifically, trying to change the life that she wants for herself. One of those places is the farmer's market. She really wants to be the cottage girl girly and she meets one of the vendors, a woman named Ash, who is perfect. She's capable, she's artistic, she's incredibly pretty and incredibly charming and Rosemary, to her surprise, finds herself in obsession, in love in attraction to this woman, though she never dated women before. And it goes as you'd expect any first Suffolk experience, Suffolk infatuation to go. Uh, she is losing her marbles over this woman. She's obsessed. She wants to know everything. She wants to flirt with this woman. She doesn't know how, but she wants to. She wants to be her girlfriend. She's jealous of every single other customer. She's constantly at the farmer's market. And finally, Ash notices her. So they start dating and Ash is such a mysterious, such an alluring person. Rosemary doesn't know what to do with herself. She wants to know everything, but she feels like Ash is holding back, that she's not telling her everything, that she has some secrets, and Rosemary is really not good with secrets, which is to her detriment, because Ash is not what Rosemary expected. You know that the story is going to get violent, it's not a secret, it's not one of those haha plot twist type of stories. It's very clear from the atmosphere that it's going to get violent, that something dark is lurking within, that uh, Rosemary is naive and doesn't understand that she's in danger. But that's the charm of the story, I guess, because you expect things to turn dark. You're waiting for this moment. You're anticipating it. You want to see how Rosemary is going to handle it. You want to see what's going to happen and uh, how the things are going to be resolved or not resolved. It's definitely 
horror adjacent. It talks a lot about darker themes surrounding Suffolk relationships and Suffolk dynamics that sometimes occur that not a lot of books are brave enough to talk about because not a lot of media critics how toxic it is that we click so easily and so quickly get into relationships and allow other women to overstep our boundaries because we're just not scared of women. We do not consider them threats. This book is very clear on that. Women are threats sometimes and you have to be careful with strangers. I love that part of the story. I also loved how dark it got. I also loved the atmosphere. I also loved the anticipation and the tension in the story. I loved how we'd get very romantic seemingly moments that would get interrupted with something completely out of whack and how Rosemary would try to explain it to herself and could convince herself that it's fine, it's fine. Because she liked Ash so much because she was so obsessed with her. I love this story. My Hannibal fans, you should read it. You will recognize a lot of troops. It's not particularly long, it's very short and I listened to the audiobook. The audiobook is pretty good too. The next book that I read was Peter Darling by Aston Chant. It was a self-published Peter Pan retelling and we've read it for book club as well. This one was interesting to read as a book club book because there's a lot to talk about when it comes to it. It's a very interesting retelling in general because Peter Pan's whole conflict is around being scared of puberty and being scared of growing up, being scared of being a grown man that has to do grown man things as per society's expectations. And in the story, Peter is a transgender man who is scared of growing up because of the puberty specifically, because the world outside of Neverland doesn't see him as the person that he is. This was very, very interesting. This was so fitting for the Peter Pan retelling. It had a lot of great conversations about gender and expectations and toxic masculinity. Peter essentially felt like he has to perform uber masculinity. The masculinity maybe uh, that he doesn't connect with, but he has to perform to be seen as a man. In the story, Neverland is the place where he's accepted. It's his playground. He can imagine anything he wants. And uh, he is imagining all this adventures for himself where he is capable, uh, where he is violent. He is a very great, morally great character in this book. He's very violent. He plays at war because he is a man and that is what expected of a man. This this story features an older Peter Pan. He's not a young boy, he is a man. And um, it's interesting how the conflict changes a little bit because of the changes that the order makes. Where the story falls short for me is the romance element. I actually do not think that it added to the story. I think it subtracted from the story. At first, and we were talking about it uh, in our uh, book club chat, at first I was down for the Peter Hook romance because I thought it's just going to be a comment on uh, Peter growing up and experiencing new things and uh, uh, experiencing the development of his sexuality, that it's going to just add something to uh, the storyline, the main storyline, the theme of being scared of growing up, etc, etc. But somehow, midway, the story pivoted to just being a romance and we kind of forgot all this great commentary that uh, was part of the story till that point. And I didn't really like it because it modeled the message and also because the romance just felt jarring it felt like 
the genres did not mix well. I'm still unsure what would have been better, uh, romance with a more poignant focus on the romance, specifically between Peter and Hook, or just a literally fiction novel about Peter and his struggles with uh, his sexuality and gender. But I firmly believe that they would have been better as separate works. It feels odd, it feels rushed at the end because the romance is underdeveloped. It's trying to do the found fiction-y thing of, oh, there's been unresolved sexual tension all along. But it isn't really built up in the first 50% of the book, so it feels odd. And uh, it also jumbles the message because uh, the conflicts that were introduced previously, the non womans conflicts, are quickly dealt with and I didn't appreciate it. So I guess at the end I found the story interesting and it's definitely worth a read, but I gave it three stars because of how jarring the genre combo was for me. These are all the books that I wanted to talk about in this video. In the comments down below, tell me about the interesting books that you've read recently, books that you want to recommend to me, and leave an emoji of a heart in your favorite color if you watched till this bit. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you soon with another one, but until then, bye!